what is up everyone welcome back to the long lines podcast this is a podcast where i answer questions from my filmmaking and youtube community and we just talk about filmmaking and youtube so this is another q a podcast which is pretty much my bread and butter i do have interviews with other you know filmmakers and youtubers every once in a while but the majority of this podcast is just me answering your questions to the best of my abilities so that's what I'm gonna do in this episode. And just a couple of housekeeping things. Normally I try to record this podcast with like dynamic mics. They're not the best dynamic mics. This is kind of a crusty podcast, but you know, I've been keeping it going now for I think a little over two years, which is pretty crazy. But I just wanted to kind of show you what I'm using. I'm using my Comica VM30 right now to record this because for some reason, this little guy, my Zoom H1N, just will not work for more than like five minutes at a time brand new batteries in here and it just stopped working so that sucks and what i had been using for the longest time is this little guy this is the comica ax3 and it's basically a xlr adapter for your mirrorless cameras and this did work great because i can plug two dynamic xlr mics into it when i have you know guests here in the studio and for the most part, this works okay, I like it, but the problem that I've found is that it's really easy to forget that it's on, and I left it on the last time I used it, and now the battery's dead. So I just have to keep on buying nine volt batteries to keep this thing running, which makes me kind of want to get like a Zoom F3 or something like that with 32-bit float, or just get that Panasonic XLR adapter and just record it straight into camera. Right now, I'm actually shooting on my Lumix G85, which honestly is, becoming more and more one of my favorite cameras to use just because it's so cheap and it just works and I like that the autofocus doesn't work so well but as far as just a walk around do everything type of camera I love using it so yeah we're just back on a shotgun mic I'm gonna try to make it through this I don't pre-write out my answers I just kind of answer them off the cuff so these aren't really pre-planned that I'm just kind of answering them as if you asked me on the street or something like that so let's get straight in we have one patreon question this month and this question is from Travis Shore I believe that Travis actually put out a video recently testing out my original CineStyle LUT pack on his T3i footage. So I'll try to link that in the show notes below if you wanna go check that out and see what my original CineStyle LUT pack looks like. So Travis asks, best budget place to get music for videos online? I don't really like YouTube's music. I also don't use transitions or any other effects. Just looking for decent music. Yeah, so there are two places that I can recommend. I'm gonna recommend three, but the third one is pretty expensive and it wouldn't really fit in with your budget question. The first one I think that everyone kind of goes to is Epidemic Sound. Now, I feel like they have really good music and sound effects. The only problem is music on, on Epidemic Sound still kind of feels like stock music. That's the only problem that I found there. They don't really have any like, you know, like big name artists on Epidemic Sound really, uh, but, but they do good stuff. The only problem I feel like with Epidemic Sound because so many people use it is that you'll start hearing the same songs in a lot of people's videos just over and over again. So you have to be kind of strategic in which songs you use because sometimes the really good ones are already used. And then the second best, I would say that is a pretty good deal for what you get. I think it's $14.99 a month. So the thing that I like about audio is that for the $14.99 a month, you're not gonna get like the Link Match AI feature, I don't think, but they do have much higher caliber music on audio than I would say Epidemic Sound offers. And they do have some sound effects there too, which isn't as extensive as the Epidemic Sound library. I found that for sound effects, Epidemic Sound is probably the best place to go. But yeah, audio is a really good place to get royalty-free music. And again, $14.99 a month isn't too bad. But I am gonna just mention Musicbed. It's very expensive, I understand that. I am an ambassador for Musicbed, and I feel like once you start getting at that higher tier of work, I would highly recommend going to Musicbed. I know that I talk a lot about budget stuff on my channel here. I just can't recommend Musicbed enough. It's such a higher quality place to find music. And you know, with a Musicbed subscription, you do get a similar thing to audio where you can just type in a song, say you like M83 songs or something like that. You just type in M83 outro and it'll find you a song very close to M83 outro. So that's another place. Obviously it's a lot more expensive, but as you're starting to grow as a filmmaker, I would definitely recommend looking into Musicbed. So big shout out to Travis for sending in that question. Okay, so just as I was editing this podcast, I got a couple more questions in on Patreon, so I wanted to make sure I answered them in this month's podcast. So these are both from Andy Mulcaster, and Andy's been a supporter of the podcast for a really long time. 
So Andy's first question is, what would you recommend for a single camera setup to shoot a wedding? As a GIF, I've offered to shoot my best friend's wedding when he moves here to the States, now slightly panicking as I want to do a really good job. Would you start by breaking it down by the shots that you want to capture, thinking of it as retelling their story of their day? How would you work around limitations of lighting when considering events like this when your kit or budget is not an option? So I feel like shooting weddings on a you know, budget kit, you know, can be a little difficult. I would say that if you had even just a little bit of a budget, I would rent a camera just for the down the aisle shot. So you can have one camera always rolling. That's just going to be shooting down the aisle static on a tripod. And then you can run around with your main camera. At least that's what I did back when I shot weddings. So that would be my first tip is if you have a little bit of a budget, do that. If not, you're going to have to think of it kind of as like a highlight reel. So you're not going to, you know, record nonstop the entire ceremony. You're just going to be picking off different pieces and, you know, putting it into a highlight reel, maybe have some audio rolling. But again, if you're just doing it for a budget and you don't have all the gear, it doesn't make sense to spend a bunch of money on the gear if you're not really making it back. So, yeah, that's what I would recommend. Think of it as a highlight reel. And, you know, like weddings are almost like documentary. It's like you can plan all you want, but really things are just going to happen the way they're going to happen and you just have to be there to capture it. So it's good practice learning how to shoot weddings and, you know, tell a story after you've shot everything. You can have shot ideas in your head. Like I always have like some go-to shots that I want to get when we have the time to like create shots. But if I'm not creating a shot, then I'm just kind of capturing what's going on during the day. So the groom and his groomsmen getting ready and the bride and her bridesmaid is getting ready is usually what I start with. And then we'll move into the ceremony and then we'll move in to the reception where things like, you know, toasts and the bouquet toss and dancing happens. If you don't have a lot of lighting, try to utilize the light that is going to be there. You know, don't be fr- afraid to like shoot in higher ISOs. It's better to have grainy footage that you can at least see and look back on as opposed to trying to keep your ISO as low as you can and then underexposing everything. So That's what I would say. And again, if you're doing it for cheap or, you know, possibly free, keep that in mind if you're doing the best you can with what you have. And that could be something that you should ask the bride and groom. I would always meet up with the bride and groom, even if it's only for a little bit before their wedding, just so that you can kind of get an idea of what they want and what they're expecting for this wedding video. All right. Andy's next question is, when do you need a gimbal? I find for most of what I currently film, a tripod in-body image stabilization is okay. Would you say it's more down to the aesthetic you are trying to achieve? Yeah, I mean, I think it's more down to the shot that you're trying to do. There was a time back when, you know, gimbals were getting really popular where everyone was just shooting everything on a gimbal, even like shots that didn't need to be on a gimbal, like they would just be on a gimbal anyways. Their camera would just live on their DJI Ronin, which I just thought was weird because I feel like the gimbal is a specific tool for a very specific type of shot. So that's my like perspective is unless you're doing a walking shot down the aisle or I'm just, you know, using weddings as an example or like the dancing stuff where you want to kind of like be in it and do some nice pans and stuff like that. That's when a gimbal is great. But if you're just like shooting candids or whatever, or trying to get close ups on the bride and groom as they're saying their vows, you don't need a gimbal for that. You need a monopod or a tripod or just a nice telephoto lens and maybe some in-body image stabilization, and you could do it even without a monopod or tripod. So I think they're just a tool for a specific shot. If you want that nice floating movement shot in your video, that's great, but you don't necessarily need one. So yeah, those are the bonus questions from Patreon. Now let's go back to the main video. And I'm actually trying a new thing in this podcast, which is asking for voicemails. So I created a SpeakPipe account where you can send me voicemail questions. So I actually got one, which is pretty cool. Um, I've never used this website before, but I got one from Ian, and this is what Ian has to say. Hey, Nigel. I think I might have asked this before, but I've been curious for a long time why you put tape over the logos of your camera. Just seems uh, like an interesting practice. I'm really curious why. So yeah. So yeah, I actually have been asked that quite a few times, Ian. And one of the main reasons is when I was traveling a lot, I didn't like to broadcast that I had a, you know, super fancy camera. So, you know, sometimes covering up the logos can kind of help with that. And it can make the camera look not super expensive when you got tape all over it. But yeah, you can do that with gaff tape. Gaff tape doesn't really leave residue as long as you don't let it heat up a lot. So yeah, I cover my logos with gaff tape and the high scratch potential areas. So those are like the two reasons it 
you know, makes your camera not look as fancy and professional when you're out traveling and it can also protect the camera. So anytime I buy a camera new or used, I try to put gaff tape on all the places that it can typically get scratched on. So underneath the camera where the tripod mount is on the top of where the flash is because I'm screwing things into the hot shoe all the time. And so when I go to sell it, I take all the gaff tape off and the camera looks brand new. So that just helps with like the selling factor as well is if you can keep the camera looking pristine, once you go to sell it, it's going to look way better and be worth a lot more than if it was all scratched up and heavily used. So that's the reason that I cover my cameras with gaff tape. Okay, so now we're going into the YouTube community page questions. Man, I got a few good ones here. The first one is a three-parter, which I feel like I've been getting a lot of. The first one in this question is Sony versus Panasonic for recording video. Now, I feel like many of you will probably think that I'm gonna say Panasonic, but honestly, gun to my head, I feel like Sony makes more sense for a lot of people. In like the high-end industry, it makes sense because you have cameras like the Venice and the Burano and the FX9, FX6. And then in the, you know, lower end, it makes a lot of sense with the FX3 and FX30. And then in the consumer end, it makes even more sense with cameras like the A6700 and the ZVE 10 Mark II now. And then you got your little sidearm cameras like the ZV1 and, you know, the older RX series. Whereas Panasonic doesn't really have that same tier of cameras. They basically have their consumer end, like what I'm using the G85 and then their prosumer end, which is like, you know, the S52X, S1H, but they don't really have anything beyond that. And they don't really have any sidearm cameras that are actually good, right? All of the little power zoom travel cameras kind of suck when it comes to video. They're okay in photos, but you know, the S9 is kind of a lackluster camera in my opinion still even though I've used it and it, you know, it's basically an S five, two X with, you know, a recording limit, it still isn't just that sidearm camera that I was hoping for. So that's why I'm going to say Sony, which I think is, you know, probably going to make a lot of people upset because I'm a Panasonic shooter. But right now I think that Sony actually makes a lot more sense for a lot of people. The next question within that question is, do you have the YouTube 100 K prize? Yes, I do. You can see it right back there. Hold on. This is the YouTube 100,000 subscriber plaque that I got back in, I think, 2021 or maybe 2022. I think it was 2021 when I finally got this. I think I passed 100,000 subscribers the end of 2020, maybe the beginning of 2021. So yeah, this is this is it. If you're listening to this podcast, it is on YouTube on my second channel, Nigel Bajos 2. But yeah. I do have the 1000 subscriber plaque. It's pretty cool. YouTube sends you like a little like, you know, letter that says how much work goes into getting one of these. So it's pretty cool to have. Now I say that and there is a lot of work that goes into getting a 100,000 subscriber plaque, but I also feel like I see a lot of like, uh, you know, dog TV channels with 100,000 subscribers or people just upload stock footage of parks and stuff like that for you to play while you're out. So your dog can watch TV and it's like, doesn't seem as special when those type of channels get a plaque like that too. <laughs> the third question within this question is, do you think AI will take over work in the future? Um, maybe certain types of work. Um, I don't think that it's gonna really take over what YouTubers do. I, I, you know, I feel like it's always kind of like people will always pay more for the real thing. And even if AI can get you like 90% there, the people that actually make their own stuff without using AI, I feel like are gonna still pull ahead. So that's just my opinion. I don't really like, I'm not super anti using anything that has to do with AI. I just like, I'm never going to watch an A like a fully AI video and think, Oh yeah, this is sick. You know, I'm always going to like rather watch videos that are made by real people. There's a bonus question asking what I think of their channel. I'm not going to do that on this podcast, but I think they tried to sneak their name in there. Uh, one of the perks of following me on Patreon is I give you a little shout out in this podcast, but I don't do that for everyone on the uh, YouTube community page because that's a Patreon perk. <laughs> All right. And this next question is what's your favorite subject or genre to shoot? I'd probably say action sports is probably my favorite thing to do. I grew up filming skateboarding. So filming action sports just comes really natural to me. I like filming skateboarding, running, trail running, you know, mountain biking, that type of stuff. I just feel like that's what my eyes drawn to. Like I like filming people do you know, heavy action things. So I like filming action sports, but honestly, 
I feel like I could learn to love filming almost anything. But given my history, I just feel like action sports are kind of where it's at. All right, so next question is, here's my question. When you're making a video for yourself, where do you draw inspiration from? For example, when shooting photos for the day, I listen to a specific music and wait for a scene to speak to me and say, please take my photo. I know that sounds weird, but it's how it works for me. I'm wondering if you have a similar experience making videos. Also, thanks for all the great videos, cheers. Yeah, so I mean, for the most part, where I live is pretty like inspirational for me. There's just a lot of really beautiful places and I get inspired to make stuff when I go out and hike and stuff like that. But I also find inspiration from other filmmakers. I feel like a kind of a hack to figure out different ways you can make your videos is like going on Vimeo and watching some of the staff picks. The people at Vimeo always pick out the best things to feature. So yeah, go look at some of the staff picks on Vimeo and you'll get a lot of inspiration and ideas from what, you know, the highest level filmmakers are doing. And I still feel like I'm still learning how to make my videos unique and stand out. So yeah, sometimes Vimeo watching some random spec ads or something and seeing what other people do, it gives me a little inspiration on what I should do for my own videos. All right, here's another five parter. So there's five questions within this comment. First one is what monitor do you use for editing? Now this one is probably not super impressive, but I've been using it for so long and I just like how it looks and it covers a good amount of the color range that I need. And it's actually a monitor from 2018. It's kind of got a little bit of a cult following behind it, but it's the Dell U something, it ends in 18. That's how I know it was from 2018. But I'll I'll put the, the actual model number right here. But yeah, I think it covers 99% of the sRGB range. It's one of Dell's ultra sharp monitors. But yeah, I've been using it for the longest time. I calibrate it with a Spider X color calibrator and it looks great. Uh, I do want to eventually maybe get like a better BenQ monitor, but I've just been using this Dell one for such a long time. And, you know, for the most part, when I grade something there, send it to my phone or my iPad, it looks relatively exactly the same as how it looks on my Dell monitor. So yeah, I'll put the link here. And if you wanted a cheap monitor, I think they go for pretty cheap nowadays in the used market. So that's another little freebie hack for you is you don't have to buy the craziest, most expensive monitor. You know, as long as you get one that covers a good amount of the color range and you calibrate it properly, you can get some really good results out of your grades. Something else that I do to my monitor is actually I put a 6500 Kelvin bias light behind it. So that helps me, you know, perceive contrast a little bit better. So, so the next question within that comment is, do you have any tips for exporting videos to have the best quality? I mean, not anything new or exciting. If you want a good video, I'll try to link Matt Johnson's video on YouTube exports in the description. He does a way better job of explaining all that than me. Most of the time I do render out my YouTube videos in ProRes uh, proxy, just because I feel like that compresses the video just enough, but not as much as like H.265. So that's what I do. Uh, it takes up a lot of hard drive space, but it just gives me the best export for YouTube videos. All right, the next one in this comment is, do you ever feel like you overshoot or undershoot? So I feel like I most of the time undershoot, that makes me have to go out and then shoot more. So that's something that I'm trying to do more of is shoot more than what I think I need, especially for like paid projects and for YouTube videos. It's always a better practice to shoot more than to shoot less, unless shooting more is gonna take up precious time and make you you know behind schedule or something like that. For the most part, I try to shoot as much as I can so I don't have to go back out and do reshoots. Uh, what advice do you have for a beginner editor? Uh, learn DaVinci Resolve. That's my advice. Don't start on Final Cut Pro. Don't start on Premiere. Learn DaVinci Resolve. One, because it's free, and if you're a beginner, free is great. And two, it's becoming kind of the industry standard for a lot of people. A lot and a lot of people are using DaVinci Resolve to cut their films and to grade them. So if you can learn how to cut your films and grade them within DaVinci Resolve, you'll be a step above me. I mean, I have, like I cut in Premiere and grade in DaVinci and I don't like having to do like that jump back and forth, but I'm just way faster in Premiere. But if I had learned in DaVinci back, you know, when I was 16, which is 2006, and I don't think DaVinci Resolve was even available at that time, I'd be a great editor right now in DaVinci, but I didn't. I learned in Premiere and now I have, you know, 10 plus years of, you know, Premiere experience 
well, actually I have like 18 plus years of, you know, premier experience. So it's just really hard for me to switch. But if I could give one piece of advice, you won't have to, you know, be in the struggle that I'm in if you just learn resolve from the get go. So that's what I would say. Learn DaVinci Resolve really well. And then the fifth one is your endings are so good. How do you? Yeah, that was something that I was doing a lot last year. And I was kind of seeing if it would like, you know, pick up and people would really respond well to it. I think that they did. I don't do it so much anymore where I kind of just give a really harsh cut at the end of my videos. It was fun for a season, but now I'm just not doing it as much anymore. I'm glad you liked it though. I thought it was funny when I was doing it. Okay, so this is one that I wanted to spend a little bit of time on. I haven't thought of an answer yet, but I saw it and I was like, oh, that's a really good topic of conversation. The next question is, would you ever have a Sony plus your S5 2X and G85? Wondering if you would ever split brands. It would be beneficial to know what you think, mainly because I just got an A7 III and a Lumix 5.2 on top of the GH5 I have. So yeah, that is a really good question and something that I've been pondering a lot because right now I haven't split brands. Like I don't have two different camera brands right now. I have a Lumix G85 and a Lumix S5.2X. But what would happen if I bought a Sony? Well, then I would have three different lens mounts that I have to be buying lenses for, right? Because I like trying out new lenses and sometimes I'll need a lens for one camera, but right now I have the most lenses for the L mount. I have, I think, three lenses for Micro Four Thirds. So yeah, having a Sony camera would throw kind of a wrench in like, okay, now I have a third lens mount to buy for. Obviously I could just get a like an EF to E mount adapter and use you know some of my vintage lenses on a Sony camera, but to me that's always been the upside of having Sony cameras is if I had an a7 III and like an a6700, I could use my a7 III lenses on my a6700 and even vice versa if I wanted to shoot in the crop mode of the full frame camera. Like my personal advice would be stick with one lens mount. It doesn't really matter splitting brands. Sometimes people can be a little bit OCD about not wanting to have an Olympus and a Panasonic, you know, micro four thirds camera, which I'm kind of like that. I have a little bit of OCD to where it's like, I don't like to split brands that way, but I think it's more important not to split lens mounts, right? So if I had like a S5 2X and a Sigma FP, that would make a lot more sense in my mind because yeah, they're different brands, but they're the same lens mount or an S5 2X and a Blackmagic Pocket full frame L mount camera. That makes a lot more sense because then you're not buying a bunch of different lenses. So right now it is kind of frustrating because I am splitting lens mounts and that's I think the more important conversation to have is do you want to be picking up a bunch of different lenses for different lens mounts. And I think that if I had a Sony right now, it would make it even more complicated. So that's what I would say is stick to the same lens mount if you can, and that'll make your life a lot easier. So if you have an a7 III and an S5 II and a GH5, you do have three different lens mounts. You could get some vintage lenses and use them on your both, you know, your S5 II and your a7 III. But I would just figure out which image you like the best, which lens mount you like, which menu system you like, and then maybe just stick to one because you'll make it a lot more easy on yourself if you just have one lens mount. And if you go with Sony, then you could get, you know, some other smaller cameras that have the Sony E mount and use the same lenses on all of them. If you have S5 II, you know, you could get the S9, I guess, if you wanted to. That's the problem again, where it's like, what sidearm do you get for the S5 II? The only real companion is the S9 right now, which is kind of a bummer. Or you could just sell both of those full frame cameras and go full on with Micro Four Thirds, uh, replace your A7 III and S5 II with a GH7 and then just call it a day. <laughs> yeah, that would be my advice is try to find one lens mount, one camera system that you like and just stick with that. I think that it'll make it a lot easier for you. <clears throat> Man, my voice is just dying today, guys. Hold on. Okay, this next question is genuine question. Why don't you look into old Sony cameras like the NEX lineup or the old A6000 series? Those are small and extremely good in video. Also, the autofocus isn't crap like the Lumix. So yeah, um, if you haven't been following my channel for a while, you probably don't know that I did use a Sony A6000 back in the day. I had that camera for a while and I really liked it. You know, seeing that those older 6000 series and the NEX are extremely good at video, I think is a little bit of a stretch. You know, I think a GH5 is way better than any of the older A6000 series cameras. My main gripe with the A6000 series cameras was that everything from the A63, 64, 65, and even the 66, and then even the 6700, all those cameras overheat. 
if you're like filming in, you know, 4K or like in like a hot environment, they've gotten better, like, you know, progressively better over the years. But I remember when the A6300 came out and that was like a really big topic, like crazy overheating issues. So that's one thing that like, you know, filming weddings that I used to do back in the day when I had the A6000 or, you know, filming just like long events and stuff like that. Like I couldn't have my cameras overheat and I needed to film really, really long takes at the time. So, you know, now I could see myself getting an A6700, but back in the day when the, like the older A6000 series cameras came out, I just, I needed something far more reliable than, you know, a camera that would overheat on me. And that's why the Lumix cameras have always been my go-to is because even this old G85 won't overheat on me and it can film, you know, until the card runs out of space. So that's just my own personal preference is I just need a reliable camera and the A6000 series and even the NEX series just warrant that for me. But I have had an A6000 before and I've actually been thinking about picking another one up because I'm doing this, you know, legendary camera series and, you know, the A6000 was a camera that I owned. So picking it up again and seeing how I like it in 2024 might be a kind of a fun little experiment. Okay, and the last question for this podcast comes from Nate's Film Tutorials, which if you watched my last video, that was a little vlog that I did with Nate from Nate's Film Tutorials. He came over to Oregon and yeah, we went and saw a bunch of stuff here in Oregon. I tried to show him as much iconic stuff as possible, but I'm only shouting his name out because he is a buddy of mine and he asked, sweet photo. He took the photo that's in that Q and I asked, how do you script your videos? Are you filming B-roll or taking notes? Or do you do it when you're all finished filming? Yeah, so I think that there's only one correct answer here. And you may not agree with me, but I think that this is the most efficient way to make a video, especially a YouTube video. So I'm just gonna use a camera review as a example. If you were making a camera review, I think that it makes the most sense to go out and film all of your test footage first. Once you're all done filming your test footage, you kind of know the camera a little bit, know what you like, what you don't like, then it makes sense to script out your voiceover if you're gonna do a voiceover or make bullet points for your talking head and then film your talking head and then you film your B-roll. And the way that you do it in that sequence is because filming your test footage, you gotta get to know the camera, you get to know the things that you like and you don't like about it. Then you can write out the things that you like and don't like about it in your talking head or your voiceover. And then once you've got your whole talking head cut or your whole voiceover cut, that will kind of prompt what B-roll you need. And if you did it the other way, where it's like you filmed a bunch of B-roll and then you went out and you filmed, you know, the footage and then you recorded your talking head. If you recorded a piece of your talking head where you're talking about the size of a camera and you didn't get any like footage or like some B-roll of like what the size of the camera looks like, you know, it's like, well, then you just have to go and film B-roll again to, you know, get a clip that you need. You know, let's say you're reviewing a camera that's, you know, really small. It's like, oh, this camera is only as big as an iPhone. If you don't have that B-roll clip to put in there, then you're just going out and you're having to film B-roll again. But if you film all of that and then you cut it, then you'll know, okay, I'm gonna make a note. Like I do it in my notes app. I talked in the talking head or the voiceover about how the camera is small. So I'm gonna get a shot of the camera next to an iPhone to illustrate that. And then that's how you make your B-roll list of things that you need. So that's how I do it. I think that's the most efficient way to make a video. And yeah, that's, I think, the best way to do it, in my opinion. So yeah, that was the last question for this episode of the Long Lens Podcast. Hope you enjoyed it. Again, if you did, feel free to subscribe to my second channel on YouTube, Nigel Barros 2. And leave me a rating on whatever podcast app you use because that really helps a lot. But yeah, uh, tune in next time. I did record a podcast with Nate from Nate's Film Tutorials here. I think it might be out of focus though. I looked at it a little bit and was like, dang, kind of sucks when like you have two like filmmakers and we can't get a decent looking shot. But uh, I think it was still a fun conversation. So at the very least, I'll put it out in audio form if I can't stand how out of focus it is. But yeah. Anyways, thanks for watching. I'll catch y'all next time.